I entered high school in 1938 in a brand new native stone building constructed by, yes, the WPA. The economy had taken another downturn and unemployment was back up to 19%. Our family was in as dire a situation as ever. I found I qualified for help from the NYA, National Youth Administration, and was awarded a job working in the high school library for one period every school day. For this, the NYA paid me $3 a month, which enabled me to buy my own school clothes. To put the figure in proper perspective, in our town the wage for a grown man was then $2 a day. In the winter, when farm chores were minimal, Daddy became a salesman. He went door to door in town or to the neighboring towns of Mountain Grove and Houston. He stocked several small, inexpensive items that would enable the buyer to save money. The item I specially remember was a tiny whetstone, perhaps three inches square, for sharpening razor blades, so they would last at least ten times as long. He himself used one of those whetstones for years. I recall it took him a bit of time, patiently pressing the razor blade back and forth on the V-shaped surface of the whetstone to produce the ideal sharp edge. Daddy would give up laboriously sharpening his razor blades only after World War II started and he got a job again. When I started high school in 1938, the thunderclouds of war were massing on the European horizon. Hitler's Germany had taken over Austria and was threatening the Sudetenland, a German-speaking area of Czechoslovakia. Britain and France gave in to Germany at the Munich Conference, and Britain's Prime Minister Chamberlain proclaimed they had won peace in our time. Grandpa didn't believe a word of that. His denunciations of FDR were now eclipsed by his tirades against Hitler. Still, he held fast that we shouldn't tamper with Europe's troubles. That FDR, if we don't watch out, he'll get us into Europe's war, just like that other Democrat Wilson did 20 years ago. In 1939, Nazi Germany and communist Russia negotiated an alliance. Within months, both invaded Poland and World War II was on. By 1940, the focus of the American public was not on economic policies, but on issues of war and peace. In that uneasy situation, Roosevelt was elected to an unprecedented third term. He pushed through a Selective Service Act and young men began immediately to be drafted by the thousands into the army. Unemployment was still high, 14.6%, but it was dropping, no doubt because of the draft and the expansion of manufacturing and trade in war materials as the U.S. became, in FDR's words, the arsenal of democracy. We know what happened next. Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941. Suddenly, all over America, factories were running full tilt, three shifts a day, to produce the ships, planes, uniforms, rations, and the multitude of military necessities to fight a war on two fronts, a war for survival. Not even Grandpa would complain that the programs were too expensive that by spending so much we were mortgaging our children's future. He assumed, as we all did, that unless we spent so much, our children would not have a future. Unemployment by 1944 dropped to the lowest figure ever recorded in the United States, 1.2%. By then, my father had been working swing shift in a California shipyard for a year. My brother was in the Navy, and my mother and I joined Dad in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I also went to work at the shipyard. I believe that today the majority of Americans think that Roosevelt's New Deal policies 
ended the depression. I was there. I know they didn't. They did succeed in mitigating it. Daddy's WPA money, my NYA pittance, really helped us through. And I know that the road Daddy helped build and the high school building the WPA finished in 1938 are still there serving the community. I shudder to recall that the only stimulus package that worked was the massive murderous one of war. Please God, never again. I would suffer through an entire lifetime of depression rather than to have a repeat of that war. But perhaps the key word is massive. I'm a retired librarian, not an economist. But remembering how the mind-boggling amounts we spent on the war and the amazing recovery and prosperity we experienced afterward, I can't help believing Grandpa, good man though he was, was dead wrong. We should have had the courage in the Roosevelt era to spend more, not less. Sixty-five years have gone by. I find my life bookended by the two greatest financial disasters of U.S. history, 1929 and 2008. Every time I turn on the TV news, I hear echoes of the 1930s. Any day now, I expect to hear some Republican leader denounce some spending program as a boondoggle. In my mind's eye, I see Herbert Hoover staring stubbornly down from his picture frame above our telephone. In my mind's ear, I hear the confident voice of FDR proclaiming, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Meanwhile, one of my three sons was laid off last week and my son-in-law believes himself to be at risk. Maybe I should have a farm for the family to flee to.